Chapter Thirty Two of With the Empress Dowager of China by Catherine Carl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Thirty Two, The Chinese New Year, Official Audience. The Chinese New Year, the greatest of the popular festivals, is of course celebrated with much pomp and enthusiasm at the palace. Splendid decorations, hundreds of beautiful horn lanterns with their long red silk tassels, the great red shou emblazoned on their sides, made the courts and verandas gay with color. Painted figures of red-clothed gods regarded one at every turn. Hideous monsters with vermilion faces, painted on the outside doors, brandished spears to frighten away the bad spirits. There were the usual gala representations at the theater, and the palace, as at all festivals, was filled with visitors. The Chinese pay all their debts at the new year. If they have not the ready money to do so, they will dispose of anything valuable they have in order to begin the new year free from debt. It is considered tempting heaven to begin it otherwise. A great deal of silver imitation money is exchanged at this season. It is an old custom and supposed to bring abundance during the year. At the new year, present giving reaches its culminating point in China. Everyone, rich and poor, high and low, gives presents then. Their majesties not only gave to all the ladies and princesses, but to every inmate of the palace, and even the beggar at the gate was not forgotten. But the presents exchanged at the new year are never so handsome as those given for a birthday. The presents the Empress Dowager received on this occasion were principally flowers. Her throne room was full of them, as well as her private apartments. Dwarf fruit trees twisted into fantastic shapes, laden with fragrant blossoms, and splendid plants of peonies in full flower, and countless vases of the Chinese lily, as they call the narcissus in China. The Empress Dowager tried to be cheerful, and not dampen the gaiety of the festival by her alarm, but the long-looked-for and much-dreaded war between Russia and China had then actually begun, and she was mortally anxious. The Japanese were already in Manchuria, and no one knew how it might affect China. Though I did not work on the portrait during the New Year's festivities, it was now really advancing. When Her Majesty saw how the hands looked when they were drawn in, with the palms of the hands hidden by the long fur undersleeves, in the position I had dared to find fault with at the first sitting, she at once suggested having the fur undersleeves taken off. But she still said nothing about changing the position of the hands, though I saw she had her doubts about them and I felt confident her good taste would finally prevail, and she would want them changed. I painted them in with a thin wash of color, knowing they would be changed later. A few days after this, she remarked that my idea about the position of the hands was not bad, and suggested that the left hand would look well on a cushion. I made this change in the small study, much to her satisfaction, and then did the hands likewise in the large portrait." The New Year festivities were hardly over, before the Empress Dowager decided to move the court to the Sea Palace. This palace, though not so much a favorite with her as the Summer Palace, she liked better than the Winter Palace, the latter's small shut-in courts, walled-in walks, and rigid traditions seemed to depress her. At the Sea Palace she had gardens for her promenades, and there was a lake. It was not so beautiful as the Summer Palace, but was an improvement over the Winter Palace. This move to the Sea Palace necessitated another change of studio for me, just as I was comfortably installed in my quarters in the Winter Palace, and had begun to progress with my work. I knew I should be obliged to have the new place arranged with upper-glass windows, and that I would again lose time, and the date of the opening of the St. Louis exhibition was approaching, but there was no help for it. I must go with the court to the Sea Palace." I was told that there I was to have a magnificent pavilion on the lake, with a perfect light for painting. As to the pavilions being magnificent, I had no doubt, but I did doubt, from past experiences, whether the light would be all that could be desired. One morning our chairs carried us to the Sea Palace, instead of to the Winter Palace. All my painting things, materials, canvases, as well as Her Majesty's throne, on which she was seated for the portrait, had been moved. Not the smallest piece of paper, nor even a bit of charcoal, was missing. I had painted until the last moment at the Winter Palace the day before, and early the next morning my things were in perfect order. 
the portrait on the easel, and the throne in the proper position in my quarters of the sea palace. It was an Aladdin's lamp move. The group of buildings that had been set aside for my painting fronted on the lake, and were really charming, but the overhanging verandas to each pavilion forced me again to have the upper windows put in. After this was accomplished, it was the best working room I had ever had at any of the palaces. The days were getting longer and the light better, and I hoped now to soon finish the portrait. A few days after the court moved to the Sea Palace, the members of the Corps Diplomatique were received in audience to present their congratulations to the Emperor and Empress Dowager on the occasion of the Chinese New Year. They were received in the great audience hall, but the ladies of the legation, whose reception took place the following day, were received in Her Majesty's throne room, opening on the court of the large theatre at the Sea Palace. As it was cold, the theatre and its court were entirely enclosed and roofed over in glass, in panes of about a foot and a half square. On each pane was painted in red the ever-present character show, longevity, surrounded by five bats. The marble pavement of the court and the steps leading up to the throne room were carpeted in red, and when the great doors were thrown wide, there was a good effect of size given, although this throne room was one of the smallest in the sea palace. As this was to be a formal reception, several members of the Wai Wu Pu were present as interpreters. The ladies of the legation were presented by the Baron Ji Khan, the Austrian minister, to a of the corps. He made a graceful address in French, wishing their majesties a happy new year, and China much prosperity. This was translated into Chinese by one of the secretaries of the Wai Wu Pu. The Empress Dowager replied for herself and the Emperor in Chinese. Her Majesty's words were interpreted by His Excellency Liang Fang, a good French scholar. Then the Doyen presented the ladies individually, and the usual order of ceremonies followed. When the presentations were over, the Doyen, foreign attaches and interpreters, with the Chinese officials, repaired to the hall, which had been set aside for their luncheon, while the ladies, accompanied by the princesses, went to their repast in another part of the palace. Only a few days after this came the Lantern Festival. But this was not an interruption to my work, for I painted all day and only went to the theatre for the final piece and the spectacular tableau. We dined in the Imperial Loge, and after dinner there were beautiful lantern and torchlight processions. In the court opposite the throne room where we dined, there was a beautiful pai lu of transparent gauze, painted in charming designs, illuminated from within, and hung with luminous flowers and quaint lanterns. Tall eunuchs in gala red stood around the courts, holding great lanterns aloft, like huge caryatids with luminous burdens. Others, with fanciful vermilion lanterns, wound in and out of the corridors and courts. When they reached the court of the softly glowing pai lu, they maneuvered and made intricate designs and luminous tableau, holding aloft their red-globed lanterns to form characters and phrases of felicitous omen. These huge luminous characters were wonderfully accurate. After the torch and lantern-lit processions, and the glowing tableau, a pair of illuminated dragons writhed into the court and struggled for the flaming pearl, which flitted around with elusive, fantastic movements ever beyond their grasp. I was not able to find out the origin of the imperial legend of the double dragon and the flaming pearl, representations of which appear everywhere at the palace, on whatever is meant for imperial use, or for any official function, over which the emperor is supposed to preside. It is on all the thrones of the dynasty. It adorns the imperial pennant. It is cut into stone, carved into wood, and painted in pictures. It decorates the gowns of the higher officials, and is embroidered upon the court dresses of the ladies of the palace. At the birthdays of the emperor and empress, and at all dynastic celebrations, there are realistic representations of the immortal struggle, where the double dragon strives to absorb the flaming pearl. The significance of the legend seems to be, the double dragon represents the powers of earth or evil, which try ever to absorb the flaming pearl, emblem of the dynasty, symbol of heaven or perfection. The flaming pearl, the unattainable, keeps ever beyond and above their grasp, seeming to serve always as an incentive for further effort. For a fortnight after the Lantern Festival, there were fireworks every night on the banks of the lake. We would dine in the throne room, and then Her Majesty and the Emperor, 
accompanied by the ladies and attended by the usual number of eunuchs, each bearing transparent horn lanterns, would go through the courts and paths of the garden to the lake, on the banks of which the fireworks were set up. Here, in full view of the set pieces, stood four large roomy sleds. When the lake was frozen, these sleds were used to push their majesties and the ladies over its glassy surface. They had not been used as sleds this winter, for the ice had not been sufficiently firm, the winter having been comparatively mild. But when the lake was well frozen, as is usual at this season in Peking, their majesties viewed the fireworks from these sleds as they skimmed along over its smooth surface. There was a sled for each of them, one for the empress and second wife, and one for the princesses. They were cloth-covered, lined with fur, and had great fur rugs. There were seats around the three sides. The wadded curtain, with its large square of plate glass that hung down over the front, was taken off for the fireworks. Their majesties occupied each of theirs alone, but the empress had several of the ladies in hers. The fireworks were superb. There were beautiful set-pieces, pagodas with ladies on balconies, pavilions with grapevines, wisteria arbors, and beds of flowers so lifelike they seemed to grow at the side of the luminous cascades, and many other effects I had never seen before in fireworks. One day, during the time of the Lantern Festival, we had fireworks in the brilliant sunshine. When these day rockets exploded, all sorts of curious paper devices fell to the ground, fish, dragons, and animals, as well as flags and baskets. When anything interesting was revealed, her majesty would send the eunuchs to pick it up as it fell and bring it to her that she might examine it many fell outside the palace walls and she said these would give pleasure to the quote, poor people outside end quote. formerly at these fireworks in the palace to celebrate the lantern festival the public was admitted into the enclosure but this practice stopped when the two empresses were co-regents for the first boy emperor tung chi as this was coincident with the establishment of the first foreign legations in Peking, the latter fact may have had some influence in changing the custom. The Chinese people were shut out because it was feared that the foreigners might also come into the precincts. These beautiful fireworks I could enjoy without any qualms of conscience, for I could not paint at night, and they were consequently no interruption to my work. End of chapter 32《Chapter 33 of With the Empress Dowager of China by Catherine Carl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 33 Continuation of the St. Louis Portrait Spring Days at the Sea Palace. There began now to be some discussion as to what would be the most propitious date for finishing the portrait. I had thought I might finish when I could, but this was not to be the case. The almanacs were consulted, and it was decided that the 19th day of April would be an auspicious time to finish the portrait, and before four o'clock. The Empress Dowager informed me of the happy augury of this date, and asked me if I thought it possible to finish then. Not only had the date for beginning the portrait been carefully chosen, but there was much deliberation as to, but there was much deliberation as to the proper time for finishing. Her Majesty seemed very anxious until she received my reply, as to whether it would be possible to finish at this happy date, for I could not say at first, as I had never thought of finishing at any particular moment. When I finally told her I could finish it before four o'clock, April 19th, she was delighted. She said, quote, how good, end quote, and asked me to please, quote, not disappoint her, end quote. As the portrait neared completion, she came very often to the studio, and watched over the painting in of all the accessories, which she seemed to consider quite as important as the likeness itself. As she was tired after the audiences, she gave me two or three sittings at this time before she went to the audience hall, and I painted from half-past six to eight a.m. for two or three days. The jewels in the headdress, all official, were the subject of much deliberation. After a jewel was painted in, she would decide she didn't like it, and that something else would be better. She seemed to think it was easy to take it from the picture as to remove it from her person. All these requests for changes were so graciously made, I never complained, but she would sometimes say, quote, I am giving you a great deal of trouble, and you are very kind, end quote. I didn't mind the trouble, 
only these changes took away the freshness of the painting and did not add to the artistic effect of the picture her majesty ordered a magnificent frame for the portrait she herself made the design the double dragon at the top struggled for the flaming pearl with the character show on it the sides were elaborately carved in designs representing the symbol of quote, ten thousand and quote, years with the characters for longevity the frame was to be set in a superbly carved stand as the chinese do their mirrors the whole of rare camphor wood was made by her majesty's own artisans at the palace the most expert workmen in china the days were lengthening now the trees beginning to bud and the flowers in the courts to bloom the icy fetters that had locked the lake were broken and boats again glided over its bosom in the mornings we no longer had to take the winter chairs and be carried the long distance from the gates to the throne room the comfortable boats once more lay moored at the foot of the landing steps just within the gates and we enjoyed again those ideal trips across the lake the empress dowager began to take long promenades now and was much out of doors sometimes in the mornings on our arrival she would already be in the gardens one day we met her on the banks of the lake and made our morning salutations there another day she and the emperor were inspecting the new buildings which were being erected to replace those burned during the occupation of peking by the allies when count von waldersee had his headquarters at the sea palace splendid buildings were being erected on the site of those burned the emperor and empress dowager each with his own suite carefully visited every part of these constructions and seemed much interested in their progress of course the workmen were banished during the visit of their majesties one of these new halls was to be used for the entertainment of foreigners when they are invited to the palace and many concessions had been made to foreign ideas in its construction let us hope it may not lose its chinese character i am sure the foreigners will regret this innovation and would prefer the typical chinese interior even though it be less suited to the exigencies of a modern reception sometimes we would see the empress dowager in her japanese jinriksha this was a beautiful gold lacquered affair in dragon form the two dragons heads in front it had splendid gold lacquered shafts and wheels the latter with rubber tires it was pulled by one eunuch and pushed by another and her majesty seemed greatly to enjoy this novelty for a while but she said she preferred to walk or to be carried in her open chair as a usual thing two other modern and novel methods of locomotion had been installed in the grounds of the sea palace there was a small railway which ran from the outer gates to the dwelling palaces which had its engine and complete running outfit this had been constructed by some progressive mandarins who wished to get the empress dowager's support for some railway scheme but though she often spoke of how much she had enjoyed her one trip on a real railway her spirit was too utilitarian to care for toy pleasures she couldn't stand the puffing of the engine the tiny cars and all this trouble for so short and useless a jaunt there was also in the sea palace as well as at the summer palace a number of automobiles which had been presented to their majesties by chinese nobles and officials who had been abroad as examples of the curiosities of european civilization one of these was gorgeously fitted up in the imperial yellow and gold lacquer with the double dragon the body was enclosed in glass and there was a throne-like seat within for the empress dowager the question of how the chauffeur should run the machine standing as he would be obliged to do if her majesty were inside had not then been solved she was however willing to throw tradition to the winds in this instance and was most anxious to try one of these motor-cars her entourage was however bitterly opposed to it even for a short distance in the grounds they were afraid of an accident she never tried one while i was there but i am confident that her venturesome spirit will not rest content until she has had a ride in one of these modern carriages in april kite flying time begins in china high officials and dignified literati indulge in the pastime as well as children and young people the popular pastimes of the people as well as their serious occupations being always honored in the palace kites were of course sent off by the empress dowager and the ladies the first day the kites were to be flown her majesty sent for me to come into the garden where the kite flying was to take place the kites were of paper wonderfully fashioned representing birds fish bats and even personages the strings were wound on curiously shaped reels and the cleverness with which her majesty let out the string and manipulated the kites was wonderful after she had let one go 
she graciously handed me her own reel and told me she would teach me to fly a kite. I was hard at work at my painting when I was called out into the garden, and I wished to return to it as soon as possible, and as I knew I would not be clever at kite flying, I begged her to allow me to watch her instead. The young empress and princesses were also very proficient in flying them, and Her Majesty flew hers, as she did everything else, with unusual grace. One of these beautiful spring mornings, as we were softly gliding across the lake, propelled by the graceful palace boatman, I lay back on my cushions, reveling in the scene of quiet loveliness before me, and drawing in the ineffable perfume of the spring, when my glance, roaming lazily around in perfect content, caught sight of a group of gentlemen on the bank of the lake beyond. The rays of the morning sun, glinting upon the gold of their embroidered costumes, and touching, with iridescent rays, the peacock's feathers upon their hats, revealed their rank and official standing. As it was a most unusual thing to see gentlemen in the palace enclosure, I was at once all attention, knowing there must be some important event on hand, especially as, on looking closer, I saw one small figure in their midst, more plainly dressed than the others, whom I at once recognized as His Majesty, the Emperor. As we slowly approached, I saw the Emperor go over to a plough to which was hitched an ox, and which stood at a little distance off in the field. Fortune favored me. I was to see the Emperor plough the first furrow of the year, for it was only on the morrow that the official public ceremony was to take place at the Temple of Agriculture, near the great triple altar of heaven. I was to see the private ploughing done in the palace grounds and viewed only by the princes of the imperial family and the highest Manchu nobles. When all was ready, the emperor took the handles of the plough and guided it down a furrow marked off the ground, and when the furrow was upturned, the seed was dropped in. The ox for this ceremony, which I had heard was white, was, at the palace function, of a soft doe color. He seemed to have been trained for the purpose and performed his part with a dignity in harmony with the attitude of all the assistants, and in keeping with the solemnity of the occasion. I was rejoiced to have an opportunity of seeing this interesting ceremony, and to learn that even this great rite, which I had thought like the sacrifice to the invisible deity on the triple altar, was only performed in the grounds of the temple to heaven, and to learn that every custom dear to the people, or incorporated in the national life, is observed in the palace by the emperor and empress, that his majesty really plants the first furrow of the year, and gathers the first sheaves of ripened wheat, and that the ladies of the palace really spin the first silk and pull the first fruits. The slow movement of the palace boats was never so appreciated by me as on this morning, for I was thus enabled to see well this curious national ceremony, which I would never have seen but for the accident of the hour of my crossing the lake, and the time it took to do so, for, as at all ceremonies where men are present, there were, of course, no members of Her Majesty's entourage and none of the ladies or princesses had ever seen this ceremony. End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of with the empress dowager of china by katherine carl this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter thirty four finishing and sending off the portrait the nineteenth day of april was approaching and the portrait steadily advancing as it neared completion her majesty's interest in it seemed to grow she spent a great deal of time in my pavilion watching its progress and expressed herself as much delighted with it. A few days before the 19th, I asked Her Majesty to allow Mrs. Conjure to come and see it on that day. She immediately consented, and invitations were sent through the Foreign Office, not only to Mrs. Conjure, but to the wives of the ministers and first secretaries of legations, to come to the palace on the 19th day of April for the purpose of, quote, seeing the portrait of Her Imperial Majesty, the Empress Dowager, painted by the American artist, end quote. The ladies of the legation, of course, responded to the invitation, and on the morning of the 19th, the portrait was placed in the splendid frame. Her Majesty decided she would receive the ladies first in her throne room, after which they were to come to my studio to see the portrait. As I was still working until the fateful hour, I did not go up to the throne room, but away to the ladies in my own place. Her Majesty did not accompany the ladies, when they came to see the portrait, but she sent the young empress and princesses to my pavilion to assist me in receiving and to lend a proper dignity to the occasion. 
the portrait in a chinese milieu and seen in the light in which it was painted made a better effect than it could in any other surroundings the ladies were of course much interested in seeing this long talked of picture the first ever painted of her majesty and the novelty of the precedent as well as the interest of a visit to the palace favorably predisposed them and they expressed themselves as most interested in the work finding it a good likeness the admiration it received from the young empress and the ladies of the court was almost embarrassing and the eunuchs said it was so lifelike when they passed the windows that it inspired the same awe her majesty's own presence did after the ladies had duly looked at and commented upon the portrait they repaired to one of the halls in connection with my studio where a repast had been prepared by the orders of her majesty here for the first and only time while i was in the palace the young empress sat down at the table with the foreign ladies and acted as hostess and very gracefully she filled her role after the visit of the ladies of legation her majesty informed me that the princes and nobles whose rank entitled them to enter the palace enclosure were to come see it the following day as it would not have been according to the proprieties for gentlemen to enter the quarters reserved for ladies or the buildings where even a foreign lady worked the portrait was for their visit carried out into the open court of my pavilion to place the portrait in its carved pedestal it was necessary to erect a scaffolding by which the framed picture was raised into the air and then lowered into its stand when all was finally arranged the scaffolding was removed the debris cleared away and the princes and nobles in full dress came into the court to see the portrait each one approached the picture and closely examined it even touching the canvas unfortunately i could not hear their comments as i only saw the ceremony discreetly ensconced behind a curtain but i could watch their faces and study their expressions though i must confess that they revealed very little a young man chu who had been attached to a legation abroad and had learned photography in an amateur way had been ordered by her majesty to make a photograph of the portrait this was done while the princes and nobles were still in the court when it was photographed and the princess had retired the scaffolding was again put up the picture was raised out of its carved wood pedestal and was replaced in my studio all this took the greater part of the day her majesty was so pleased with the comments she heard upon the portrait of course no unfavorable ones were made to her that she decided to accede to the prayers of several of the high officials and allow the sacred picture to be viewed by a number of other high functionaries for this purpose the portrait was removed to the wai wu pu foreign office for many of the highest officials are not permitted to enter the palace enclosure at the foreign office not only the high chinese officials but the foreign ministers and their staffs were invited to see it many of the foreigners were in full dress uniform for this visit in deference to chinese prejudices after it had been duly viewed by all in peking of sufficient rank to have that honor it was enclosed in a satin lined camphor wood box covered with satin of imperial yellow and the box was closed with great solemnity the pedestal was placed in a similar box each had splendid bronze handles and huge circular locks these boxes were enclosed in others also lined with the imperial color and were finally ready for shipment the packing cases containing the framed picture and its carved pedestal were placed upon a flat freight car which had been elaborately decorated with red and yellow festoons of silk the boxes were covered with yellow cloth painted with the double dragon a special railway had been laid from the wai wu pu to the station outside the Tian Men, for it was not considered fitting that ordinary bearers transport the picture of her majesty the officials of the wai wu pu as well as many other of the high officials in peking dressed in full dress accompanied it to the station and stood to watch the sacred picture start off on its long journey to st louis the special train carrying it was met at Tianjin by the viceroy of the province surrounded by all his official staff it was there placed with great ceremony upon the steamer on which it was to make the journey to shanghai and was accompanied from peking to shanghai by an official specifically appointed for the purpose at shanghai it was received in the same formal state and with the same official pomp as at Tianjin. it was met at the steamer by the governor of the province and all his staff and transshipped with great ceremony to one of the pacific mail steamers for san francisco 
the sacred picture was accompanied on its journey from Shanghai to St. Louis by a high official and his suite. A special car conveyed it from San Francisco to St. Louis. His Imperial Highness Prince Pu Luun, Imperial Commissioner and personal representative of their majesties at the exposition of St. Louis, awaited the arrival of the portrait there, delaying his departure for several days in order to be able himself to assist at the reception and placing of the portrait. At four o'clock on the afternoon of the 19th of June, His Imperial Highness and the Imperial Chinese Commission repaired to the art gallery, where the cases containing the portrait and pedestal were awaiting their presence to be opened. The director of the art gallery, the assistant director, and several other members of the Board of Fine Arts were also present. The cases containing the picture, one within the other, were opened, and finally, within the last, lined with yellow silk, lay the, quote, sacred picture, end quote, covered with a screen of brocaded satin of imperial hue. This satin cover was ceremoniously removed, and the picture was unveiled. The prince proposed the health of Her Majesty and the prosperity of China, which the assistants drank in sparkling champagne. This opening of the cases and unveiling of the picture lasted from four o'clock to nine p.m. A few days later, when the gallery where it was placed was open to the public, it lost, for the first time since its inception, its semi-sacred qualities. Only then did it stand upon its own merits and become as other portraits. Then, for the first time, it could be seen by the ordinary individual. Then only it became the subject of comment, as any other picture at the fair. Then it was open to the gaze of the vulgar and the comment of the scoffer. At the close of the exposition, a delegate was sent from the Chinese legation in Washington to arrange for the transportation of the picture to the latter place. The portrait and its carved support were again placed in their satin-lined cases, and it began the journey to Washington. Her Majesty had decided, when the portrait was completed to her satisfaction, that it would be a suitable present for her to make to the United States. She thought this would be particularly appropriate, as the painting of the portrait for the St. Louis Exposition had been thought of by the wife of the American minister to Peking, and as it had been executed by an American artist. Thus, the United States received the gift of the first portrait ever painted of a Chinese ruler. When the portrait arrived in Washington, His Excellency Sir Chen Tung Liang Chen, the Chinese minister to Washington, attended by his secretaries, made a formal presentation of the portrait to the president, which Mr. Roosevelt received on behalf of the United States government. End of chapter 34. Chapter 35 of With the Empress Dowager of China by Catherine Carl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 35. Return to the Summer Palace. Sending off the picture to St. Louis did not sever my connection with the palace, for I still had other work to finish. At the end of April, a month later than usual, the court moved out to the Summer Palace for the rest of the year. The country was beautiful. The trees were almost in full leaf, and lilacs, blue and white, bloomed everywhere. My garden, in the park of the palace of the emperor's father, was full of them, and over my entrance gate clambered a beautiful yellow rose bush, laden with masses of blooms. Wild flowers were springing up at every turn, and my dog, Min La, in his wild races through the park, when we were out for our walks, would often start up coveys of birds, or rabbits would scurry away at his approach. I went back to my favorite haunts in the park, to the summer house, where upon the threshold cut in stone lay the plaint of the seventh prince. It was a delightful change to be in this beautiful spot, after the four months in Peking, and to see nature everywhere budding into perfection. The grounds of the summer palace were one maze of delight. The peonies in all their royal splendor, the fragrant lilac, the stately magnolia, and the budding elms each added their charm to this beautiful spot where everywhere was lovely. I could not wonder at the Empress Dowager's desire to come back again to all this beauty. A charming studio was fitted up for me at the Summer Palace on our return. Her Majesty saw how much more satisfactory it was for me to have a proper place to work in, where I would be undisturbed, and even had she not seen the utility of a studio, I think she would have granted my request for one, for she was always kind and considerate. Upper windows of plate glass were put into the north side of one of His Majesty's throne rooms. 
behind the imperial loge. It looked over a charming terrace of the garden. The days were long, and it was a delight to live and breathe, and the quiet of the studio, where I would work at leisure, made me resume my work with renewed vigor. I began at once to finish up the small sketch of the St. Louis portrait, which Her Majesty wished to keep, and then to put the final touches on the two portraits, begun at the Summer Palace. The throne room that was now my studio had only one disadvantage. It was so near the theater that on theater days I could hear the music and the voices of the actors. And on those days, the court outside my windows was filled all day with eunuchs and their majesty's attendants moving to and fro. I decided, if it was necessary for me to go into Peking at any time, to take a theater day to do so. One theater day I did go into Peking, and on my return to the summer palace the next day, I found that his majesty, the emperor, had taken advantage of my absence to occupy his throne room the day before, for I found his theater program distinguishable by being written on imperial yellow paper, and he had also left a few papers scattered around, with characters and phrases written with the, quote, vermilion pencil, end quote, which may only be used by his majesty. On one paper, he had evidently been trying to draw a plan of the part of Manchuria, where the war operations were then being carried on. He had also drawn a part of the Great Wall of China, and the dividing line between China and Manchuria. So the emperor, notwithstanding his stoical smile, his apparent unconcern, was not indifferent to affairs in Manchuria. He was watching the course of events there, and he probably worried and grieved as much as even the Empress Dowager about what might be the result for China. He had probably schooled himself to appear indifferent. The ceremonies and festivals at the palace had been going on as usual, but the two central figures of all these functions had their own secret anxieties and cares. The emperor was following the campaign in Manchuria, and the empress dowager was probably planning and thinking of the best course for China to follow. In May, the empress dowager had another garden party for the ladies of the legation, at which she, as usual, asked me to assist. When I went into the audience hall for this reception, a few moments before the ladies were to arrive, Her Majesty, after greeting me and scanning my toilette, which was all in grey without any colour, took a pink peony from a vase at hand and pinned it on my dress, saying I needed a little colour. I had just finished the largest of the other three portraits I had painted at the Southern Palace, and Her Majesty told me she liked it so much that she had decided to show it to the foreign ladies at this garden party. As I had heard nothing of this plan before leaving my studio that morning, I had made no preparations for it. The picture was on my easel, unframed, and I told her I would prefer it to be placed in its frame before it was shown. This frame, designed also by the Empress Dowager and made by the palace workmen, was a magnificent piece of work, elaborately carved and beautiful in form. It was in the natural color of teak wood, and this quiet tone admirably set off the vivid color of the gown and accessories, and was a great improvement to the picture. When she heard what were my wishes on the subject, Her Majesty said she would see that the picture was placed in the frame, and it was arranged that as soon as I had finished my luncheon, I would return to my studio and overlook things myself, and arrange the portrait as I wished. The audience passed off as usual. Immediately after luncheon, the ladies were invited to go to the studio to see the portrait. The Empress Dowager had evidently forgotten about my wish to go there first, and as she herself, contrary to all precedent, led the way, followed by the ladies, I could not, of course, precede her. I had not thought that she would make such an innovation as to herself accompany the ladies to the studio. I felt greatly honored, but I feared the eunuchs had not arranged things as they should be, and I knew I could do nothing with Her Majesty present, and what was my chagrin on reaching the hall, in the wake of the Empress Dowager and the ladies, to find that the portrait, though placed in the frame as I had desired, was in the center of the narrow room, and every window on both sides had been opened to its widest extent, and the light came in from all sides. I had shut off all the lights of this hall, except the double windows to the north, where I had the upper glasses put in, and this is where the picture should have been placed, but as Her Majesty's throne always occupies the center of the throne rooms. The eunuchs evidently thought that was the proper place for her portrait, when on exhibition. As the halls are narrow in proportion to their length, no one could get further off than four feet from this life-size portrait. This, added to the cross-lights, was heart-rending. 
I was in despair. Her Majesty's presence prevented my ordering the eunuchs to change the position of the portrait, and besides, everyone had already seen it. The ladies, who could not do otherwise than express their admiration, in the presence of both the august subject and the artist, duly praised the portrait. Her Majesty, who knew how it looked in its proper light, and who only glanced at it here, did not realize at what a disadvantage it appeared, and was perfectly satisfied with the effect. An amusing little incident took place while the ladies were looking at it. The Empress Dowager, in her cursory examination in this light, noticed a part of the trimming of the gown where the design was not well worked out. She came up to me as I stood in a group of ladies and pointed out the defect. She took my hand in hers and said in an almost pleading way, quote, There is a bit of trimming that is not well finished. You will arrange it for me, will you not, Kurgunya? End quote. She did not believe in leaving anything to the imagination and wished every detail fully worked out. This portrait was very successfully photographed, and Her Majesty concluded she liked it much better than the one which had been sent to St. Louis. She said it would make me, quote, famous, end quote. But when I thought of how I might have painted this wonderfully interesting woman in the unique setting in which she was placed, I realized that, quote, it might have been, end quote, are really the, quote, saddest words of tongue or pen. End quote. The precedent having been established, the idea of a representation of the sacred person of a Chinese majesty being seen by the world having been accepted, the painting of Her Majesty's first portrait not having been followed by the dire results that the Chinese had prophesied, the traditional prejudice was overcome, and when she saw how quickly the photograph was made of the portrait, and how satisfactory it was, she decided she would have the photographer try one of herself and she was not one to stop at a single trial. After waiting sixty-eight years to see a counterfeit presentment of herself, I know she will now indulge this new fantasy of hers to its fullest extent, and perhaps some other artist may at some time paint her, according to Western ideas, and represent her attractive personality in its best setting. But there must always be a pioneer, and he it is, who suffers the hardships and makes the way clear for others, which must be my solace and consolation for not being able to paint her as I should have liked. The Empress Dowager consented to have a portrait of herself painted. Before I finished the first one, she told me she wanted many, and suggested my passing the rest of my life out in Peking. I painted four. Who will do the others? I felt I could not go on forever painting portraits, according to Chinese traditions, of the Empress Dowager. I could not spend my life in this dalliance with oriental splendor. The world beyond the palace gates called me. I hurried to finish my task. The last portrait was nearing completion. My sojourn at the palace was drawing to a close. Though I longed to be where I might paint in a freer way, I looked forward with real regret to leaving the palace, and especially to leaving the Empress Dowager and the young Empress, for I had come to really love them. I found Her Majesty by far the most fascinating personality it had ever been my good fortune to study at such close range. The young empress was a sweet, kind nature, full of dignity and pathos, for whom I prayed there might be greater happiness in store than had yet fallen to her lot. My sojourn at the palaces of Her Imperial Majesty, the Empress Dowager of China, my association with herself, and the ladies of her court, I shall always remember as one of the most charming experiences of my life. End of chapter 35 End of With the Empress Dowager of China by Catherine Carl.